Hey, baby, welcome to WMTG, your late night talk show for like, all like things Magic the Gathering. Of, uh, of junk cards that are- we got a caller coming in now from Baltimore, Maryland. Hey, caller, what's your name? <laughs> it's fine, you didn't break it or nothing. You just click sometimes. It's all good, baby. Caller, you're on the air. What's your name? Hillary. Caller, can you speak into that microphone, please? Get all up on there. <laughs> Hi, Andy. You call that all up on there? Look how close <laughs> it is to my mouth. <laughs> we have this problem with Anthony, too. He doesn't like to get all up on that mic. He also talks like this. Hi, I'm Anthony. I'm talking about magic cards. And I got some ideas about stuff. Real quiet, like. He's got to project. How are you feeling tonight? Speak from the chest. Me? Yeah, you. I'm great on WMTG. <laughs> and I talk show for magic cards. Hello, 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 and welcome to Lucky Paper Radio. I'm your host, Andy, and I'm here with my co-host, Anthony, number one doggy uncle Maddox. Hey, Andy. I guess that's me this week. <laughs> yeah. Can't you just picture that mug? You're a great dog uncle. You watch Sadie all the time for <laughs> us, and she loves you more than uncle. any other person except for maybe us. Sometimes it's toss-up. Uh, I think it's pretty clear she loves you more, but... She's a dog. Mm, what are you going to do? She kind of loves whoever the last person that gave her a, a warm meal was. <laughs> you got to get up open that mic, though. You're going to drive me nuts. It's hitting the cage. What do I do? You, you sit closer to the table. You're sitting like two feet back. I'm trying to be comfortable. Does proximity to a table make you less comfortable? I'm working on it. All right. No time to dilly-dally this week, Anthony, because we have what I think is a great topic for this show. We don't always have full-fledged topics for the shows. A lot of times we're just talking about whatever interests us currently in Magic. But this week we're going to be talking about how to approach drafting a new cube for the first time. And Anthony, I think of the kinds of Magic we play, we uniquely draft a lot of different cubes, more so than most people, on account of our playgroup being very invested in cube, us designing lots of cubes. We are oftentimes firing up a draft of a cube that neither of us have played before. And so I thought it'd be helpful for us to talk through how we go about evaluating an environment to try and win. How do you spike a cube you've never played before? Uh, I think the best way is you just go in blind and just take whatever card is exciting. Have you ever heard... Easy short podcast. Have have you ever heard Ben S. talk about how his favorite thing to do at pre-releases is just go in blind and not look at any spoilers or anything and just go to like a local pre-release without having looked at any of the cards ahead of time? Yeah, I wish I had ever had the courage to do that. Yeah, I wish I had the skills of Ben S to be able to do that and go into a pre-release and still do well. I wonder, I definitely find myself looking a little bit less at set reviews for a limited least in the last couple of years. And Is it maybe, maybe the last like 14 months, perhaps? Uh, interesting. Um, <laughs> Is that account of the lack of it, playing that, pre-releases? That's maybe. That's definitely part of it. But even before that, I feel like, um, you know, at first when I started really getting into limited, it was like, oh, yeah, the LR set reviews. That's that's the content I go to to, to learn about magic. Mm-hmm. And as it's gone on, it's like, I still listen to a lot of limited resources, but I'm definitely leaning towards the, you know, like level up episodes. And the, I don't think I even finished the last <laughs> review episode, if I'm honest. It was just like, yeah, okay, I know the removal spell's good. I know this uncommon's going to be good, <laughs> whatever. Yeah, I feel like the more I listen to them as well, I, I thought the set reviews were good as introductions to talking about a broader topic. Like, I, totally. I was less interested in hearing what cards a D versus a D plus versus a C minus. That does not interest me so much, as much as. A, evaluations that were way off from my own. Like, I mm-hmm. listen to a card, think about it, and then I think it's one thing, and Marshall and I also think it's something totally different. Or when the discussion of the card leads to a broader topic that can be applied to other things. That's what I'm really listening for. But I think especially as a newer Magic player, or like someone who is newly invested in trying to improve himself, at Limited especially, yeah. it was great to have something that was like concrete and actionable. It's not like, here's some abstract theory and like some heuristics. It's like, this card, good. And I could, you know, internalize yeah. that and then and then move on once I sort of got that. It's the, it's the practice to the rest of the show's theory. Yeah. Anyway, this is going to kind of be, I think, our practice episode a little bit. And I think this is a great topic for a couple of reasons. One, I hope this episode will appeal to people that maybe aren't cube designers, don't own their own cube yet, and just want to listen to this to get a good sense for how to draft a cube they've never drafted before. I also think from the cube design perspective... The things that you expect players to be looking for first are some of the things you should definitely consider about your environment. Would you agree that, like, 
things that someone is going to try and discover when they're attempting to spike the environment are things that should be on your mind when you are designing a cube. Totally. I mean, as we've talked about a lot, like I definitely try and approach designing cubes as a game designer and trying to like make it a clear experience and like think about the entry points, think about how people are going to sort of read and experience the packs. And part of that is, yeah, having like signals that make sense for players. Right. So because we are talking about specifically evaluating a new cube in context, we're going to save our pack one pick one for the end of the show so we can put all of our newly established skills to the test We'll be doing a listener-submitted cube to see what we'll take first out of that pack. So Anthony and I each made independent lists of the things that we think are most important, roughly ranked lists, when evaluating a new cube to play. I think we're just going to kind of alternate, go back and forth. I expect we probably have some of the same things on our list, maybe not in the same order, but do you want to... Take it away and just start with your number one thing, most important thing when you're drafting a new cube. That's very generous of you. I'm, I, I feel like we are going to overlap a little bit. So I was looking around. We don't have any dice in the studio, but who's going to get first crack and eat How this is it list? we don't have any dice in the <laughs> studio? That's a real mark of shame for a magic podcast. Shame. 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 It's I'm very well organized. All my dice are in one bowl. <laughs> yes, you have, you have one dice bowl in the house. I'm going to make you go first, because I, I do all I do so much talking here. You know what? I want to hear from you. All right. And I think you're you're happy to get my bullshit out of the way. Oh, false. Oh, no. False. We're going to get... Unless the first thing you say is, uh, first identify the cards with the best art, and make sure you take those for your pretty deck. Then I'm going to be excited to get this out. I'm not going to be quite that bad, but here's what I'm going to say. My first thing I do when I'm trying to evaluate a new cube, so I'm sitting down where, you know, with a new group or with the same group, and somebody has a new cube, I'm going to read the description of the cube. All right. <laughs> now, here's a genuine question. Do you actually think the description of the cube on Cube Cobra or similar gives you some insight into how to win at that cube? If, if you're strictly caring about, like, I tell you you've got 20 minutes and you're going to draft this cube for $20,000, are you going to spend the time to read the entire description? you think that's the best thing for you to do? I, I'm really glad that you asked that because that's the, the same question that I immediately asked myself as I was writing this stupid list uh, was, does that actually make sense? Like, do I trust cube designers enough, basically, is, is kind of what it comes down to, to actually know what, like, the optimal strategies are if they're writing. Because, you know, a lot of cube designers do have a pretty thorough write-up of, here are my goals, here's what I want to work, here's what I want to make happen. And I think there is a lot of valuable information there. But yeah, is it actually going to be correct? Or if it, it would an actually very skilled player sit down and just be like, well, no, do ABC. And where I landed was possibly not, but also that's not my goal when I sit down to draft a new cube. I'm not necessarily just saying my, my absolute goal is to win. It's also to, you know, make the most experience of learning about that environment, learning about what that cube designer is trying to accomplish. And even like if they're not quite on point about making sure that the thing that they're trying to make the fun thing is the winningest thing, it'll, I think, still give you just a much better framework for understanding like what you expect to see. And, and from that reference point, even if you then, looking through the list, doing everything else I'm sure we're going to talk about this episode, adjust from a baseline that is a little bit more concrete. It's a very generous first point. <laughs> I, I appreciate your generosity of spirit. I feel like this is the, you know, if you show up for a, a computer programming interview and they're like, how do you how do you invert a binary tree? And you're like, uh, yarn add binary tree Google tools. How to <laughs> Google out to invert tree. binary tree, <laughs> execute binary tree inversion script. Uh -huh. <laughs> but yeah. uh, there's also some truth to that. I, I will say that reading the description on Cube Cobra did not make my list. And it's not because I'm not impressed with cube designers' grasps of their own environments, respective environments. I think it's because a lot of the stuff contained in the description is aspirational. It's what people want the cube to be. In my own example, totally. too. Like, it's, it's what I want the cube to be. Whether that actually is borne out in gameplay, people could disagree reasonably. Now, I know that your description on Cube Cobra, which we'll obviously link in the show notes, especially lengthy for the regular cube, and you describe at length, have a draft strategy, a drafting guide for it. Uh, not everyone goes that far, but I feel like most descriptions are actually not what I'm looking for if I'm trying to, to spike a cube draft. But... Obviously, we're not all purebred spikes. And if you're not playing for $20,000 and you're just drafting a cube with your friends, then I would totally agree with you. Read the cube description. See what the cube designer expects from their environment, wants their environment to be. 
because that will help inform your experience drafting that cube. I mean, a lot of cube designers, I think, you know, it's it's a thing they put a lot of effort into. The, oh, the they list definitely put themselves. a lot of effort into it. And they definitely put a lot of effort into the description as well. And, and I'll sub in, like, if you're playing with people in your local play group, just, like, ask the designer about their intentions and have a conversation about them. I feel like that's that's hmm, the, the same thing at this point. What's, that, what's a conversation? <laughs> it's it's a new that, thing like? that we all haven't had in 14 months. It's like having uh, blog posts at each other in a room, a physical room. <laughs> it's Yeah, exactly. Well... That's not on my list. My number one thing, which now I'm thinking maybe is your number two thing, or we'll find out. The first thing I look for if I'm trying to do my best competitively in a cube draft, and I'm looking at a new list, is I want to see if there are any... So you're already looking at the list. You you saw the overview tab, and you said... Go right to the list. Go click on that list. Right to the list, baby. I mean, I guess it's important to check the overview to make sure it doesn't say somewhere like, oh, we... <laughs> not a cube. <laughs> <laughs> right. Not a cube, or uh, all the cards tagged this are not included in the draft. You just get them for free at the end, or, you know... If you draft one Squadron Hawk, I'll give you six. All spells cost two less to cast. So these that's are a pretty important, <laughs> important thing to things read. you can find in the overview. That's a pretty important thing to read. So that aside, first thing I look for in the list is I want to know if there are any broken strategies supported. And I know broken, not a clearly defined term. I'm going to define it as a deck that is powerful and proactive enough such that it does not have to care at all about what its opponent is doing. Com- completely ignore them. So the examples of this are Storm... Fast reanimator, like you know, turn to Grizzlebrand stuff, channel decks, any really consistent combo deck. This is the first thing I look for because I think if these decks are present and are supported, I want to be drafting one of them. I do not want to be playing a cube where this is one of the things one could be doing and not be doing that thing. Yeah, that makes sense. And it makes sense that uh, as a person who doesn't super enjoy those strategies and doesn't include them in a lot of their own cube designs, that's definitely not the thing I look for first. I want to distinguish this a little bit from. I think a lot of people will conflate what you would do if you're looking at a new cube to play it versus like what you would do if you're looking at a new cube to like offer design criticism yeah, or something. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I want to be clear here that I don't care about individually broken cards very much here. With one small caveat, I'll give you in a moment. I don't care if there's Sol Ring in the pa- in the cube. I don't care if there's Mind Twist in the cube. These are just powerful cards that I will take yeah, if, if I get them. If you see it, you can get it. It's not like a thing you need to know before you have that first introductory experience of cracking a pack. Right. The presence of Soul Ring in a, in a cube or Moxin or Mind Twist doesn't make a deck draftable that otherwise wouldn't be draftable. But the presence of Supported Storm, the presence of Fast Reanimator makes whole new archetypes viable and I want to be doing the broken thing in a cube that has broken stuff. The, the best example I can give of this is if you look at LSV's approach to drafting the Magic Online Cube. He's got, you know, hundreds of draft videos on YouTube. You can go and watch them if you want. And if you watch his, he'll talk through his thought process in a pack. And you'll see that because the Magic Online Cube does support some broken strategies alongside other stuff like red aggro and green-white mid-range and whatever, LSV always wants to be in one of those broken strategies. Because if that is the thing you can be doing, then... That's probably your path to the, to the most winning a strategy, I think. Yeah, you're not there to draft a, a C if you can draft an A+. Plus. Right. Now, even this first point is collapsing a lot of complexity because how do you determine if Storm is supported in a cube? That's a question in and of itself we could talk about at length. Is it even possible to really truly consistently support Storm in like a 720 card cube where you're only seeing half of it each time? There's a lot to unpack there, but that's a topic for another day, perhaps. Let's just say... Whatever definition you have for whether a broken deck exists and can be supported, that's the first thing I'm looking for. Now, I said that I didn't care about broken cards, and that's true. Uh, Individually broken cards that do not constitute a broken strategy are not going to affect my approach to the draft, with the only exception of if a lot of those broken cards are concentrated in one color, the best example of this just being blue in any vintage or legacy cube that is playing all the most broken blue cards. I guess vintage cubes specifically. Because if there is Ancestor Recall time walk, mana drain in the cube, I genuinely think it makes blue a couple ticks more appealing than any other color because you might just pack three, open a mana drain, and you're going to want to be able to play it as opposed to having to pass it if there's that many cards in a particular color that are much more powerful than other options. I've never seen that come up outside of specifically vintage cubes and specifically blue, but that's a thing that could happen. If a cube had enough density of broken cards in a specific color, that might change my approach to drafting it. Yeah, I mean, I think on a higher, more abstract level, what you're saying is if there is like a particular color or strategy that is much more powerful than another, you want to set yourself up for success. But I think it, when it's outside of those like really obvious known quantities, it can be really hard to see that just from looking at the list. Yes. Like if you're looking at a popper cube and you're like, what, what are you looking for in green that is like the standout broken green deck in popper? Well, so... My- I would say in most popper cubes, there isn't a thing like this. Right. So the first, this, is a, this is a Boolean, right? I'm looking to say, 
are there broken strategies that are supported? If not, go on to the next most important thing to look at in this cube. So for a lot of cubes, I, there's nothing I look at and say, oh, this seems like a totally broken strategy, and that's I should be aware of that. But if there is something broken, then I, I want to note that and try and be one of those decks. Makes sense. What is your number two thing to look at when trying to approach a brand new cube, Anthony? So my next thing almost kind of encompasses this. I've spent the time. I've read the overview. I know exactly what this cube designer wants to, wants to do. Next up, I read a biography of I the cube designer. I go Because read... where they were born can really tell you a lot about their perspective on the game. Well, I think even before we get to that, it's really important that we really uh, understand where Richard Garfield was coming to. So mm-hmm. <laughs> there's a short bi- biography of Richard Garfield that I, I like to reread every time I approach it. Just the refresh cube. it. What I like to do next is get into the list, start looking at cards, and look for specific patterns or archetypes that both look familiar and look unique and sort of stand out. So, I'm glad our lists are so different. This makes for a much better podcast. I thought okay, our lists were going to be the same, but I think it's going to be way different. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, this this encompasses to a degree what you're talking about. You know, if I see, like, there's a clearly a set of cards that I'm familiar with that form uh, a sneak attack deck or a green ramp deck or a, a red aggro deck, those are things that I'm going to start putting down sort of markers in my mind and thinking, okay, these are the kinds of things that I see that I know sort of how they operate and are going to give me sort of anchor points to compare other kinds of decks. So if I know that I've seen this set of cards working at sort of at this power level, here's the other set of cards that I don't know as well, but mm-hmm. I'm, I'm comparing it to that baseline of the thing that I expect will be draftable, uh, either that I could draft or that I'm going to face in the draft. On the other hand, I also like to sort of notice what is unique and different. Are there like key signpost cards to an archetype that I'm unfamiliar with. And in the context of both, has the uh, the cube designer sort of explained some of this and pointed out some of those things that I might just overlook because, like, let's be honest, we all overlook the less familiar cards much, much more easily than the things oh, we yeah. recognize. But really try and figure out, are there things that I are worth exploring and trying and could be a lot of fun to draft in this environment and hopefully could be winning as well. Looking for patterns, looking for things you're familiar with, things you're not familiar with, basically trying to quickly flag stuff that might stand out one way or the other in a cube that you are otherwise unfamiliar with, trying to find some anchor of things you know to attach your evaluations to. Right. Either in terms of individual cards that I know typically how they perform in, you know, what what sort of the context feels like, whether it's a, a popper or a, a sort of mid-power level or powered cube, and also in sort of like collections of cards that I expect to work together in a consistent way. My second thing is... Another one that sounds very simple, but actually collapses a ton of complexity under it. Okay. The second most important thing, I think, for me, after presence or absence of broken strategies, is what is the speed of the environment? And I think this is important because I think it dictates the playability of almost every kind of card in the cube. If the cube is a very fast cube, then certain types of removal are much higher priorities. Certain types of tempo plays are higher priorities. If the cube is a slower cube, then... Other kinds of spells, two-for-ones, more mana-intensive spells become more appealing. And so I think determining the speed of the environment is the next most important thing for me if I'm trying to understand and draft a cube successfully. Uh, Guess what? That's my third thing. Hey, we got an overlap finally. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I think that all of what we've already been saying is about sort of getting, or at least what I've been saying is about getting context and sort of just sort of observing what's different, like what what's the overall impression of this context. And then I think you're totally right. Like speed is really, really important. And I think in most formats, you know, you don't even have to get an impression of like the average speed of a deck to really get to the meat of this and what's important. You really just need to get a sense of what is the fastest deck. Yeah. Because that's, that's right. what's going to set the tempo. That's going to be what every other deck that sits down at the table is going to have to have some proactive defensive plan to compete with that fastest deck. Uh, so often that starts with, let's look at the red section and see we'll see how many... Uh, see, and, I start and... with white normally, but interesting. fair. I think that's a reasonable choice. <laughs> <laughs> it's further to the left. But either way, trying to get a sense of like, if I just sort of take this cube, take a fraction of cards that you'd expect to be able to draft and put together like a reasonable collection of these efficient red or white cards... What is the fastest deck going to look like? What do you specifically look for if you are trying to understand abstractly before you play the cube how fast the game is going to be? You said you're looking for what the fastest deck is. How do you know how fast that fastest deck is? Now this is all going to fall apart because it's super, super hard to look at a list and say, like, I know how fast it's going to be. Context is so, so important. But really, I mean... Maybe this is uh, less sophisticated than where you're at, but I I set my expectations low for a new cube. Like I'm there to learn, but it is about looking for the 
density of effects, especially the density of effects at very low mana cost, sorry, mana value, and quality of them. So, yeah. and and really importantly, it is relative to the size of the cube. So it's easy to look at like a, a 360 cube because we've looked at a lot of 360 cubes and sort of expect like what are like hard numbers of things. But just making sure I'm also aware if I'm looking at a larger cube, make sure I adjust that as well. Yeah, I don't want to be too reductive, but I have found that specifically one drops with two power in aggressive colors in most cubes is like a canary in the coal mine for how fast the rest of the environment is. It's certainly not the most important thing for determining the speed of the environment, but I think the kind of cube designer that includes a given density of those effects versus someone who includes twice as many of that effect is also going to be reflected in all the other card types such that I find that's a pretty good analog for just the overall speed of the environment is how many fast one drops are there that are they're in the cube to try and get me dead. Yeah, I think definitely at the like highest like in the area of the highest power level cubes that's definitely a a reasonable heuristic to be clear i don't think that applies to just the highest power level cubes i know we've talked before about how aggro is relative right like yeah aggro and fast decks are only relative to their environment so there's nothing to say you can't up those aggressive threats uh you know a point on the mana curve and then have all your other decks kind of follow suit but decks with one drops are always going to be i think significantly faster than decks without one drops and so it's not that if I see no one drops, I say, oh, there's no aggro here. There's no fast deck. I just say, okay, this fast deck is much slower than sure. what I'm used to. Yeah, I see what you're saying. And that will inform, like, basically, I think if you don't have a density of, of aggressive one drops, then four and five mana spells become very appealing to me because the difference between two and four and five is nowhere near the difference between one and four and five in terms of just how many threats your opponent can put on the board and get you dead before you can get those big spells out. So For sure. I don't mean to be gatekeeping about what aggro is there, but I think... There's enough cubes at all rarity levels and all power levels that do include aggressive one drops that the density of those, I think, says a lot about the speed of an environment. Though it is, of course, not the actual, it does not the entire story, but I, again, I found it to be a good representative factor that kind of points to the rest of the decisions of the environment about how fast the fastest deck is. Real quick, I'll make sure when we talk about each of these points, we also talk about, okay, this is what we're looking for. How does it actually affect our draft pick? So I think like my first point was pretty clear. If there are broken strategies supported in the cube, I want to be doing one of those broken strategies. So I'm going to like be looking for those cards. I'm going to be looking for cards that support those broken strategies. That's what I want to be drafting. The speed one here, the way this affects my decisions is if I notice it is a fast environment, what I'm going to prioritize is either if I am a fast deck, then I've already kind of looked at some of the cards that I'm going to prioritize. I already have a sense of the density of one drops or the density of equipment or burn spells or whatever you want to use as that metric for aggressive decks, I have a sense of those densities. If I'm playing a controlling deck, I care very much about having cheap interaction. So I will really highly prioritize stuff like shock, disfigure, these like cheap removal spells that don't always scale up to every single threat, but what they do is very efficiently buy you time against those fastest decks, if those fast decks are present. If they're not present, then when I'm drafting a faster deck, I'm going to be looking for reach because I'm not going to be expecting to be so fast that I can kill my opponent while they still have most of their cards in their hand. And so what I want is reach or some kind of synergy within my proactive deck that is going to overcome the stall that might happen in the late game when I get to the point where my cards are just a little bit worse than my opponent's cards. And if I'm playing that slower side of the spectrum, I'm going to aggressively draft two-for-ones, card advantage, and more unconditional removal because what I want to do in that situation is have the gas to go long with other slow decks and I'm not as worried about having that cheap interaction to deal with fast decks. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for for me, when we start talking about speed, that's really when I start moving out of just like getting overall impressions, setting a baseline for what my expectations are, and starting to pl- apply actual like evaluations to the power level of cards in terms of like how aggressively I'm going to take them in the draft. Uh, and exactly like you say, if the the faster the format is, the more you need to focus on early and cheap interaction and efficiency. Uh, and the slower format is, you often want to focus on two for ones and value. Yeah, basically the card advantage, the value access will come naturally if you are playing a slower deck and you can survive to the late game. Like I don't think you need to worry about having your divination in your control deck in a very Mm -hmm. fast environment because the card advantage is going to come naturally when you just have a blocker and all of their creatures are small and you finally stick a blocker if you don't have a removal spell for it. Or you play a board wipe. A 3-3 is a pretty good 3 for going one against three Savannah Lions. (laughs) Right. Or you play a board wipe and, you know, it's a 4 for 1, right? You kill four of their creatures with one of your cards. Like, that's where your card advantage comes from. You don't have to actually think about card advantage as a discrete goal of a deck in those kinds of environments. Whereas in slower environments, you really do have to think, 
all right, if I just am playing threats that are just as powerful and threatening as my opponent's threats, how am I not going to run out of gas? How am I going to overcome the sort of on the board stall and and win a game of value, win a game of attrition? And hopefully it goes without saying that both the speed is on a spectrum and how that affects your decisions uh, in terms of drafting for early interaction versus late game value is also, you know, just skewing your bell curve in one direction or another in terms of your deck building. So speed was your number three. It was my number two. My number three is getting a little more specific and narrow. My third thing is I want to know what the quantities and qualities of removal and board wipes are. And the reason I want to know this... All right, now we're on the same page. Is this your number four? I just started by reading the description. (laughs) Uh, Great. So, and the reason that I care about this is because I think it informs... You know, I I hate saying Bane Slayers. You know this about me. Bane Slayer! But I think it informs how good higher investment threats that are not resilient to removal are. And that is a very important metric, I think, for cube environments. If yeah. there is an abundance of removal, a lot of it unconditional, if there are, you know, a lot of Doomblade variants running around, then I am not going to be excited to play four and five mana threats that don't immediately impact the board or resist removal in one way or another. Because getting blown out by those tempo plays is a very good way to lose a game of magic. Board wipes, similarly, I want to know this actually informs direct play. It's one of the first things I think that really informs my sequencing decisions. If there are not board wipes in an environment, that will really change my approach to how I draft a control or slow deck. Uh, and it will also change how much I commit to a board if I am playing against an opponent that could or could not have a board wipe. If there's a you know a 360 card cube with eight board wipes, then I'm not going to be very likely to commit to the board very heavily. I'm going to prioritize stuff like vehicles, planeswalkers, equipment that survives board wipes in my aggressive decks. If I'm playing in an environment that doesn't have board wipes, you know, so maybe it's a pauper environment and doesn't really have anything resembling a board wipe, then I will be much more excited to draft bigger creatures that give me board presence that will allow me to dominate without having to wipe the board. Yeah, I mean, those, like the most aggressive decks, sort of set the tempo for different kinds of uh, different kinds of, kinds of deck archetypes altogether, which, again, really shapes the way the environment plays out, and from that, the way you want to evaluate cards. So I wonder, the other thing I had kind of lumped in with removal was fixing, just sort of looking at the density of these different sort of key mechanics or, like, key features of the game, like, how quickly can you have your creatures removed like or what what is the the chance that your creature is going to be removed so how much can you uh invest in one creature similarly something that i feel like i feel like really influences your deck building is the quality and efficiency of fixing this is actually something i had flagged as something i don't think i care about when i'm looking at specifically playing a cube this is one of the first things i look at if i'm asked to give feedback on a cube from a cube design perspective Hmm. because it's something i've thought a lot about and i have strong feelings about including a lot of fixing and making the most of the slots available in your cube to allow your players to cast their spells. Listeners to this podcast will know if it's about me. As a player, I'm going to take good fixing if I have access to it. We take it very highly in our pack one pick ones, but this kind of falls into the category of like, it's going to affect everybody's deck. And I don't really actually think it makes specific decks draftable or undraftable, except in the most extreme circumstances. You know, we have some friends that have, 120 fixing lands in their 360 card cube and giant gold sections and certainly from a glance you can tell all right in this cube i meant to play three or four colors like that's just what this cube is supposed to be it's really not even possible to draft a two color deck but outside of those extreme variations if we're talking anywhere between you know zero and 15 percent mana fixing i don't actually think it affects my draft pretty much at all i think that's optimistic not to say that it doesn't affect your draft but i I think you're i could be wrong but i'm you're very conservative and tell me if this is if i'm overstepping here but i feel like you're very conservative very conservative politically (laughs) yikes i'm not in terms of the decks that you draft uh where you're gonna stick to monocolor aggro decks you're gonna stick even to two colors in your slower decks and i feel like you're unwilling to sort of stretch and say like i'm gonna splash around i'm gonna play this like five color deck with these like couple power outliers but I think that is, in a lot of cubes, extremely relevant. And so the amount of fixing both to figure out, like, what is the composition of a two-color aggro or two-color mid-range or these sort of greedier five-color decks is a huge part of a lot of environments. I am conservative on the mana side. Mana conservative. I'm mana conservative. <laughs> if I'm going to lose a game of Magic, I would prefer to lose while casting my spells and not lose to mana screw, which... You know, there's a genuine argument to be made that it's more fun to lose to mana screw because when I lose to casting my spells, it means that my opponent just had better spells than me and probably got lucky with their mana, and then I feel bad and salty about it. But 
I will always prioritize a good mana base. I would say in my cube, which has a decent density of fixing lands, I do prefer monocolored aggro. Most of my decks are two colors, and I oftentimes will splash a third in any non-aggro deck, any mid-range or control deck. But it's a splash, and that's on the back of 60-plus fixing lands in my 360-card cube. I think it definitely falls under the conservative mana approach in terms of cube players at large. You're right. Some environments are dominated by greedy decks that are playing power outliers and not worried about their mana. Well, I mean, I think I think that's overstating a little bit. I think it's worth considering even before it is dominating. Sure. I think the consideration given to those decks is not actually a factor of fixing almost at all. It's a factor of how fast can these fast decks punish the would-be greed and the slow mana development of a greedier mana base. It's what are the payoffs for being in that greedy deck? Are there a lot of gold cards I'm going to wheel because someone's not going to be in those colors and I'm going to get powerful cards late in packs if I just prioritize whatever paltry fixing there is. I mean, there are plenty of cubes that have a quarter of the fixing my cube has where I think it is correct to draft three, four colors every single time because that's just the makeup of the cube. I think in that constellation of considerations that affect the viability of that deck, I think fixing is like 10% of the consideration. Hmm. I, I don't totally agree. I think it is an important thing. All right, now agree. we got like a I, podcast episode, I, baby. I, we got disagreement. I definitely agree that all these things are related in very complicated ways. And I think the most important thing really is speed, which is why I look there first. Because right. if you're going to be under pressure, it, like the, the difference between having a, a bad mana base versus a pretty good one is, is going to really put a check on that risk that you're taking. But I also think that like if you are in an environment that has a lot of fixing and you can afford to be greedy and still consistent, that absolutely can affect your draft. Like, what is the optimal draft strategy? So let's get down to brass tacks. Let's talk about the ways it does affect your draft. Does it affect how highly you actually pick fixing lands, the density of them? Like, would you pick them lower or higher depending on how many there were in the cube? Interesting. So, I mean, it's we're, it's also complicated. This is the first we're... in a series of questions, by the way. It's not the only thing I'm going to ask about pick orders, but... We'll see if we get there. <laughs> okay. We might go off on a tangent. It's it's a very complicated relationship between speed fixing, and I think the other thing is synergy. If we're in a cube that has... Okay. Synergy. 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 Uh, synergy that has a lot of like really focused archetypes where it's like, well, it actually really pays me off just for being like green-red to pick everyone's favorite color combination, I'm sure. I've been drafting a lot of green-red lately. I love it. Green-red can be fun. Then there's not a super motivation because like a lot of the green-red cards will work together in a, in a certain cube. But in others, it's more just like, well, there's a lot of like one color pip cards that are just extreme standouts in terms of power level and mm-hmm. just just picking more of those and focusing on fixing in those high power cards is also going to be an optimal strategy. Yeah, I think for me the big thing to look at there is the speed and then the payoffs again for being in that greedy deck. Right. So can you be a greedy deck and then what are those payoffs? And it might be synergy. I think more often it's really hard for synergy to be the payoff because that is another thing that has to go right. Now you need your mana to go right, and you have to draw your synergies of cards in the right combination and right order. I think it's oftentimes just the raw power level of the gold cards, basically. And the best example I can give of this... Yeah, I mean, I, I, say, I say like splashable things, because I don't think it just has to be gold cards. It can also just be a powerful card with one pip. Like, uh, Maybe? I, I do think that a, a broader power level band in a slower cube is the kind of cube where you want to be drafting a greedier deck. Because... If the good cards are a lot better than the medium cards, then it is worth the risk to have a shakier mana base and play those really powerful cards. Right. And the other the other aspect of that that I'm trying to sort of get to is that it, there's also a difference between are these cards good because they fit together in certain ways or is there just a power delta of cards and I just want to take the best ones? And yeah. I, I, I didn't include this on my list because... I think that speed is something you can legitimately start to, you know, dig through a list and, and get an impression of. Right. Uh, I think this takes, like, you have to spend a good half hour with a list before you really start getting familiar with, okay, is the power of these cards generated because of the context interaction of other cards, or are they just a collection of individually powerful cards? Like, and, and where on that spectrum they follow yeah. is much harder to, to get a sense of without doing some playtesting. Yeah. On this point, I think the the meta of a cube, which is, like, very few cubes, except for like the Magic Online cube, were actually drafted enough to have any kind of an established meta. But there's like a theoretical meta, right? There is a meta, it's just that we don't really know what it is. I think the meta of a cube and how it affects the viability of these greedier decks is not entirely different from looking at like the meta of a standard environment. And if you look at standard before Zendikar Rising, we got Omnath printed, and all of a sudden, it was worth it to be four colors in standard. Did we get a little more fixing? Sure, but the fixing was actually fine in standard before that. It wasn't for lack of fixing. Those decks weren't playing four colors. It was for lack of a good reason to play four colors. 
Omnath was a good reason to play four colors. I think it's pretty much the same with cube. If you have good reasons to be playing greedier mana bases, then it's worth it. And I don't actually think, barring extremes again, barring like no fixing at all or obscene amounts of fixing, I don't actually think fixing density is anywhere near as much of a factor of just what are my payoffs to being in that greedy deck. But it's just another, it is it is the speed access to the multicolor deck. Is it not? Say that again. Like, if if what I'm worried about is there's a faster monocolor deck that's going to beat me down before I get my legs underneath me, uh-huh. another way to combat that speed, in, in addition to early interaction, is just having efficient fixing so that I can guarantee that I can actually resolve my plan. Hmm. And, like, if speed and consistency are also related in a really complicated way. They where are. It's like consistency is kind of like it's just like widening the bell curve to your speed right sometimes sometimes it'll come together widening (laughs) the bell curve to your speed. i'm really trying to follow this i'm not a very smart guy i'm doing my best though consistency is widening the bell curve to your speed so you're imagining it's a speed bell curve right and so we have the fastest decks is is speed bell curve it's probably not i'm guessing i don't think speed no i'm saying like you have you have like an average an average speed Okay. For, for your deck. You say, like, here's my medium speed. Okay, I expect it sure. to go off on turn whatever. And then consistency is just saying, well, sometimes it's not going to get there and I'm not going to actually, like, draw the right fixing. I'm not going to draw the, the, the right cards in the right order to actually get me to an effective board position as quickly. But I think that only matter is in comparison to monocolored aggro decks. Because if all the decks are two colors, then all the decks are going to be similarly slowed down or sped up by the availability and quality of fixing. So... Maybe you can look at density of fixing to figure out how good is monocolored proactive decks in this environment, because if the fixing's awful, then I know that my advantage for being monocolored is slightly better, because I don't have to suffer this bad fixing. But as soon as you have a two-color aggro deck, or any kind of proactive deck is two colors, they are also going to suffer in almost exactly the same way whenever fixing is available. That, that's my feeling about fixing overall, is that it affects every deck, except for monocolored decks, and because of that, doesn't really, in my opinion that much affect the viability of a given deck. But I think that's relevant because in a lot of cubes, the, the fastest deck is going to be a monocolored deck. Like you said, you're going to look at the mono white section. And I think if, if that's not the case, then it's going to start sliding into three color is going to be relevant and a, an important part of the environment. Yeah, I, I guess. Perfect. I think that was a productive conversation. <laughs> I'm not sure where we landed. I, I, I still feel like of all the things I'm looking at to try and evaluate to try and inform my spiky picks in a, in a draft, I don't think fixing density is going to weigh very heavily. Now, I will notice if it's an extreme outlier, which, I mean, we should kind of say for, for, for starters, like, we talked about the first things we would look at. Obviously, if I open up a cube list and there's a whole color missing or every single spell is one CMC or one mana value uh, or something, like, really extreme like that, obviously, we're going to take note of those things even before... Oh, I didn't skip over that. <laughs> okay. Those were covered in the overview. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You did read the overview. <laughs> So if there's anything that's a really extreme outlier, I'll notice it. But I think anything within the typical range of fixing, I just don't think the difference between 15% fixing and 12% fixing or fetch shock shock fixing and fetch shock fast land fixing is going to really matter at all. No, I, I agree with you there. If we're talking in that sort of narrow that's range 99% of, cube design, of cubes, I think. Well, my, my, my cube list on cube cover would disagree. No, you have the same density of fixing. That's you're, you're, you're in that bell curve, and you're playing at and a different power level, so you have different you know kinds of fixing, but that's commensurate with the environment. Sure. There's very few cubes, like way less than 1%, that are above like 15% fixing, and uh, actually surprisingly more than you might expect at like 0 or 1% fixing, because I think a lot of those could be things that aren't actually cubes. There are other things on Cube Cobra that are throwing off those numbers, and then it really starts picking up at like 5. So we're between like 5 and 15% fixing is the vast, 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 vast majority of cubes. Lands are boring. People on Cube Cobra agree. Ah, I think Lance are great. <laughs> that was my three, and then your four. Yeah, my my last my three was speed and density of removal fixing, and I didn't specifically list board wipes, but that's kind of the kind of removal. Yeah, it's an important kind of. I will specifically seek them out, uh, mm-hmm. and you can find them all pretty quickly by just checking white, black, and then the gold sections that contain white and black. Red does have some board wipey things, but I find that if I've never seen a cube that doesn't run any board wipes in white, black, or white, black, gold cards, and then does have a bunch in red. I mean, it's certainly possible, but I have not yet seen it. So you can check pretty quickly in the sorceries of those colors to figure out, are there board wipes present here, and have that inform the rest of your draft and gameplay decisions. Do you think if there were, you would be in a cube where you'd expect to see, like, wildfire and stuff like that, and you would have already picked up on that in your quest for broken stuff? I don't know. I, I, I can't imagine a cube that would want to play wildfire and not other board wipes in other colors, but someone make it. Or send me the list that already exists. Prove me wrong, listeners. 
So what's your next thing? That's all my things. That's pretty much all my things too. The last thing I have is actually probably pretty close to your first thing, which is that after I've looked at all these things, and again, my three are, are there broken strategies supported? If so, I want to be drafting a broken strategy. What is the speed of the environment? This informs the playability of creatures of all different sizes and removal of all different kinds. I want to know what the speed of the environment is. And then what are the quantities and qualities of removal and board wipes? Those are, I think, my three most important things. I think with those three things, I get really far in a cube list. The fourth thing I have here is just, I do, after all of that, want to look at what the cube wants me to do. I think this is kind of what you're getting at with the overview section. For sure, yeah. After I've assessed for my own spiky purposes, are there broken strategies? How fast is this environment? How much removal is there? Then I'm curious to know, what does this cube want me to do? And I'm actually, even in this situation, more keen to look at the cards themselves than the overview and figure out, are the gold cards here signposts? Are they going to tell me what this designer intends for this color pair to do? Are there, you know, specific cards that stand out to me that don't otherwise don't fit or belong in some way that tell me a little bit about what this cube is, is trying to accomplish? And that I take with a big grain of salt. It's not that if the cube wants me to do it, I'm going to do it because I think it's the right thing to do. But this gets on... To, I have a couple of things listed here that are like things that I actually think are kind of meta level. But one of those is that I really struggle with familiarity bias when I'm looking at cube lists. We talk about how important context is. And context! Even given how much we talk about it, and even given how many different kinds of cubes I've drafted, I have a really hard time separating myself from what I know to be successful strategies in cubes I know when I'm drafting a new cube. I suspect if you or you, the listener, are thinking that, you are not unique. (laughs) I think everybody has that. And if you're aware of it, you have much less familiarity bias than everyone else. Like, I think we are all struggling with that that's a nice thing for you to say though i (laughs) I still think mine is maybe worse than other people's but you know and and the classic example of this is like if you're used to drafting a legacy or vintage cube at a very high power level and then you just drop down and start drafting a pauper cube there's a lot of cards that are in both cubes but they perform very differently and if you try and draft a vintage or legacy style control deck in pauper you are going to be sorely disappointed to find that that is not an option and a lot of the cards that are good because they bolster that control deck just aren't good anymore and that's a very very hard thing to to break free from and so i I will look for a list and figure out what are the cards that jump out at me just because i'm familiar with them and what are the cards that i'm not familiar with that i'm surprised to see here and why could they be here is it because they're very viable and part of very powerful strategies i should be aware of So my second thing. Here is the other thing I will say, and this is, again, a meta-level thing, not directly related to the cube itself, but I think who you're drafting with is incredibly important if you are trying to spike a draft. This is a, a different level of context, but the example I can give for this is that I would say, on the whole, if I were to look at the densities of aggressive creatures in the Magic Online Vintage or Legacy cubes, I would suggest that they don't really support fast aggro decks super well and the environments are actually somewhat slow however those environments are tuned to wizards many many years of running these cubes and looking at the pick orders of cards and looking at the win rates of decks and they're really tuned to the fact that they have learned that people that draft cube on magic online just don't really like playing aggro if people are not queuing into a, a phantom draft where they don't get to keep any of the cards and there's pretty low stakes in terms of prizes they're not queuing into a cube draft to just try and spike with mono red or mono white every single draft. As a result, those decks are more open than they have a right to be if everyone was drafting to purely win percentage. You know, But people are not. People want to do the fun, weird, broken stuff in cube. For a lot of people that are playing Magic Online, that appears to be what cube is about. It's about doing the fun, weird, broken stuff, playing the cards they don't otherwise get to play. Because Which, of that... I don't hate it. And because of that, those strategies, which otherwise... I don't think you're sufficiently supported for a table full of spikes become perfectly viable because if no one else is fighting you for mono red cards at all, then you can draft a pretty reliable mono red deck in the magic online cube and do pretty well with it. Same with mono white. So who you're drafting with and what you know about them, I think has a big impact on the viability of a thing in your given seat. And obviously you can't know always for sure. Right. And I think absent any good information, you should just assume that, Everybody else at the table is going to try and spike the draft just as hard as you are. And if you think something is powerful and broken, assume other people are going to think it's powerful and broken too, right? You have to trust your card evaluations in these in these moments. But if you know that this is a, you know, this in this group, this person always forces mono green. Like, don't get into mono green if you know this person loves force mono green. So like, you do mean it both at the level of, like, understanding the play group broadly that, like, usually mono red is underdrafted here. But also at the micro level, like, we're sitting down with Mark. Mark's going to draft mono red. 
Yeah, I mean, on all the levels. I think uh, the context of who you're playing with, if you're strictly trying to play for win percentage, does matter. And a lot of people that are listening to this podcast, hopefully, are people that they're queuing up for a new cube they never played before, and they want to know how they can do well at it. And that's one of the ways you can do well, is understand what the meta is going to be of the players you're playing with. And that could be broadly on Magic Online or Arena or whatever, or that could be very specifically in your play group. You know, you know everyone likes to do broken blue stuff, just stay out of blue, you know? Like, our play group does love blue. I noticed that uh, blue is oftentimes split between four or five decks in, in my cube, and your cube as well. Our cubes sure. are very different, but blue just ends up getting split because people like blue a lot. And as I don't a result, think that's super unique to our play group. It's probably not, and the result is that sometimes players seem to think that blue is underpowered because they drafted blue and didn't go so hot for them, and it's like, well, four of the people also drafted blue, so I don't that's, know what to tell yeah, you. Yeah, that's a great point. Turns out, like, if you were to, like, categorize people with magic colors, people that are magic players are blue mages. For the most <laughs> part, yeah. There's a, there's a big overlap between logical approach to the world, <laughs> caring about knowledge and improving yourself, and playing a game like magic uh, extensively. Checks out. So I think that does matter if you are trying to spike the draft, is trying to understand that context as much as you possibly can. And this gets to the, like... We talked about the playtesting paradox on a previous episode. This is all tied in with that. I think it's very difficult to borderline impossible to ever separate the actual viability of a thing in a cube with just the preferences of the people that are often playing it and testing it, especially if you have a pretty small play group where it's the same people that are testing it over and over again. Are things viable, broadly speaking, if they work in your play group? No, they're just viable in your play group based on their predilections, but... You know, everything you would say about a cube can, can be completely thrown up into the air by a playgroup with a certain type of approach. And so that is ultimately, I think, very important, though it's kind of unknowable for a lot of people. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I think it's important to emphasize that that experience and the fact that that's kind of the wonderful thing about cube. That oh, it, it is. is it absolutely designed is. for a particular playgroup. So whatever your experience as a playgroup is, is valid. And if somebody else comes in and says, well, this archetype is horrible, why are you playing it? If it, if it works for you and it performs well... That's oh, you mean valid. the Steve archetype where nobody but Steve <laughs> takes those cards and so he gets them every single draft and always does well? I've had great success with the Steve <laughs> archetype. I'm not sure what you're talking about. Or at least about. Steve does. I have maybe one more bonus thing. Maybe this is less of a bonus like, round. Uh, bo -bo -bo -bonus. evaluation tactic or, or like a, a good thing to keep in mind as you're evaluating Q, but more of a, a heuristic keep in mind. that I'm noticing as I happen to maybe be scrolling through a cube as we're trying to do a podcast about cube is hey. I tend to look mostly just at the cheaper cards in every color. And I'm not sure how much this That's has to good, do with just, a good hint. is it about like partly just finding the speed, but also like those are very often the cards that shape the game. Like Those are the cards that are going to be cast most I'm often. I'm going to yeah cast my one and two and three drops in a lot of games, and my five drops are going to matter sometimes, but not as often. So And in a lot of cubes, frankly, the five and six and higher drop should say, I win the game if yeah, I resolve this, unless you have a very specific answer. And so while they might have interesting flavor applications or they might be signposts for an archetype, like once you're paying that much mana for a spell, it damn well better almost win you the game. And so... They're kind of interchangeable in that regard. It's like, yeah, big spell that wins. Got yeah, it. You cast a Colossal Dreadmaw, what are they going to do? I mean, you. I think you joke. I think you jest, but we have talked I on never, the Discord. I never joke about Colossal Dreadmaw. We have talked on the Discord about how, in a lot of cubes, Colossal Dreadmaw basically just Primeval Titan. Is, is that more of a criticism of Primeval Titan? <laughs> it's just an observation that a lot of people think Primeval Titan is very strong, and I think a big part of its strength is that it's a 6, it's a six, six drop with 6-6 six, six stats and trample. And the fact that you get some lands is cool gravy. It makes your draws a little bit better. It just makes you, it makes you really excited to attack, so your opponent starts dying. And you incidentally <laughs> exactly. win before yes. you... You're like, it, it tricks you into at attacking. All, look at all these lands I have dinosaur. that you've done nothing with while your opponent died in three turns to a 6-6 six, six with trample. Yeah, there's, there's often not a huge benefit you're gaining from further ramping once you've already gotten to six mana. The benefit is you have a 6-6 six, six with trample in play now, and that's going to be pretty good. And your deck is so thin. So thin. So thin. But you're, uh, you're so, uh, you're so thin. I think that's a great one. I really like that point of, it's something I do too that I hadn't really noted consciously, but looking at the cheap cards is, I think, critically important because they are going to shape most games and it's going to tell you what it's going to look like for the most part. Uh, and then the big finishers, kind of interchangeable. Yeah. Anything else? I think that does it for me. In, unless, unless, of course, you want me to tell you that I, I do just scroll through and look for any particularly interesting illustrations. Sure, you can say that. Okay, I do that. Great. <laughs> As promised, we are going to end with a pack one pick one from a listener-submitted cube. 
this listener did not know what they were in for when they submitted this cube. We got a whole podcast dedicated to how we think about new cubes and approach new lists before we do this pack one, pick one. This cube comes to us from listener Ryan, and this is another peasant-ish cube. We get a lot of peasant-ish cubes in our in our inbox, I think perhaps because of your influence with your cube that you've described in the past as being peasant-adjacent and at a lower power level, but still doing fun stuff. So this cube is kind of peasant in spirit, but does have some rares, quite a few rares, actually, I would say but still described as peasant-ish. So for reading the overview, we'll get that from it. Let's um, dive into this pack one, pick one. Unless you want to like, do you want to talk about anything you're noting at a high level on this cube list before we do the pack one, pick one? Or do you want to do it all through the lens of the pack one, pick one? I've made the mistake of looking at the pack one, pick one, and I, it's it's spoiled. It's all out the window. All right, great. I'll <laughs> read the cards, and Anthony's going to tell us what he is looking at from this pack. The pack is Vindicate, Wall of Omens, Rimrock Knight, Essence Scatter, Charming Prince, Badlands, Utopia Sprawl, Weaver of Lightning, Watery Grave, Artisan of Kozilek, Super Duper Death Ray, Thrag Tusk, Hedron Archive, Bayou, and Booster Tutor. Booster Tutor. <laughs> well, Anthony, what are you taking out of this pack? Booster Tutor. Now, why are you taking Booster Tutor? Uh, for you, because I know you love it. <laughs> I don't love that card at all. <laughs> what are you talking about? You're the one that loves Booster Tutor. No, it's actually, this is a great point. Did you read the overview? Are you sure that Booster Tutor pulls from cards in the cube? Maybe you have to open an actual magic pack. I, I, didn't actually, I didn't actually see notes for that. If it pulls from uh, actual magic packs, it's kind of unplayable. You think unplayable? Oh, yeah. I mean, the power of Booster Tutor in, I think we've you and I have played it most in my own cube, where it's yes. consistently going to give you a choice between like a reasonable threat, fixing, or removal. and Some kind of interaction, yeah. Yeah, some kind of interaction, which is extremely powerful. So let's not dwell too much on, on Booster Tutor. I think this pack really offers a, a little bit of everything. We have uh, some premium fixing in the form of multiple dual lands. Uh, we have a huge threat in the form of Artisan of Kozilek. We That's have some good aggressive threats in the form of Rimrock Knight. And early ramp with Utopia Sprawl. I think for me, it's it's going to be between the fixing and the really efficient either ramp or aggressive card uh, with Rimrock Knight. What do you think between those? I, I, I have a feeling you're going to be on a similar page. Well, I'm going to start a little higher level. I'm going to go down my, my points and note okay. what I see in this cube from, from those points. So... Again, my first thing I'm looking for if I'm trying to spike a draft is the presence of supported broken strategies. This is a peasantish cube already from that description. I'm expecting there are probably not broken strategies that are supported because once you get out of rare power level, then things get quite a bit less broken. However, I do see in this list reanimate, animate dead, and necromancy, which are certainly spells that contribute to broken strategies when they work. Now... Because it's a peasant-ish list, there are a couple things that are missing from this strategy. We don't have a super high density of really high power reanimation payoffs. I actually think the Artisan of Kozilek in this pack is among the best possible things to reanimate. We also have like a Palaka Worm, a Waker of Waves, a Breaker of Armies, Meteor Golem. All this stuff is certainly good and will win the game on turn two if I'm able to put this all together. But... It's not Grizzlebrand good. It's not still going to run away with the game completely on turn four or five if it takes me a while to get this strategy to pop off. More importantly, perhaps, we don't have some of the really appealing enablers for this strategy. I'm talking stuff like Entomb or Buried Alive, stuff like that, which allows me to actually just find these spells and put them where they need to be right off the bat. So this deck, I think, can come together sometimes based on this list. I, I mean, I'm going to have to have regular discard outlets, it looks like. I'm going to have to draw my threats and discard them and then draw my reanimation spells afterwards. But given that we don't have the really, really big payoffs for the reanimation and we don't have really reliable ways to enable it, I actually think this is going to be kind of a sometimes thing for this deck. It's not going to come together all the time. And that consistency is important in my evaluation of whether or not that strategy is supported. So... If this was overwhelmingly supported, I mean, it's hard for me to turn down Booster Tutor because Booster Tutor is so good and it's also in the color of this broken strategy. So I'd probably still just take Booster Tutor. But if we leave that aside, there's an argument to be made that if this was fully supported and every single card to make this deck tick was in this list, that you're just supposed to take Artisan of Kozilek here as a powerful reanimation target. But given that it doesn't seem as consistent from the list, uh, I wouldn't count this among my like Boolean check of are there broken strategies that are consistently supported. Yeah, and I do want to temper at least your phrasing a little bit and say like fully fully supported sounds like a very loaded term. Like it sort of yeah, just, it sounds, it sort of sounds like bit. you're saying there, there's something lacking, there's something missing from it. And I think it could well, be a, a completely reliable 
uh, strategy or you know a, a strategy that is in balance with other strategies in this cube right. and it makes sense it like you can play games where that is your strategy and your decisions and your opponent's decisions both matter but that's really not what you're looking for you're looking for things that are literally broken they are not fun because right. your opponent cannot have a chance to interact with them because they are so fast that's really fundamentally right. what a broken strategy means and you just don't want to be playing like a fair deck against a broken deck and want to make sure if that does exist you're in a situation where you can actually like compete on that next sort of outlying level especially if that broken deck is consistent i right. do think that given the cards in this list and maybe ryan's had a different experience my guess is that sometimes the reanimation deck in this cube probably does have a start that you just can't totally beat. like i think it's going to happen sometimes and that's probably part of the calculus that ryan has done to determine how to support this particular strategy in balance with the rest of the cube is that right. it can be powerful but it only happens sometimes stars have to align you have to have your right you know and potentially you just also have to read the table and figure out that that's open rather than just thinking like if i'm not doing this i'm not competing in a reasonable way at this table right so my first uh my first question is asked and answered and the answer is no i don't think there are enough consistent broken strategies here that i would be making a mistake by waltzing into the the pod with a fair deck so I am going to say no on that. My next measurement is speed of the format. This is a 420 card cube. Nice. And there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight one drops in white, most of them aggressively statted. There are seven one drops in red, most of them aggressively statted. And then there are quite a few white two drops and red two drops. So basically, those numbers for a cube of this size tells me that the fastest deck is probably not super duper fast. I don't think this environment is going to be marked by needing to have early interaction against multiple decks in the pod or else you're going to be fall way behind. As such, I am more interested in looking at cards that generate card advantage, cards that are individual power outliers, and cards that give me you know two for ones and unconditional removal so I can actually remove the similar kinds of threats from my opponent. Do you agree with that assessment? I do. I, I think I actually, in a similar axis to think about like uh, red aggressive decks or white aggressive decks, I think that green ramp decks also set the tempo in a way where That's true. if they can sort of just add to the battlefield in a way that is faster than someone can interact with them. Like it is it is similar, like it is card disadvantage to play your ramp spell and then play your one threat. Absolutely. But it's a tempo play, and that tempo is really what we're talking about when we're talking about where are you going to fall in the tempo versus value axis. Right. I mean, just for a point of comparison, my 360-card cube, which is the cube I'm most familiar with, probably, in terms of playing and drafting and designing, I have 13 white one-drops compared to the 8 white one-drops in the larger 420-card cube. So just in terms of the speed I'm perhaps used to, like I'm thinking about my familiarity bias, I'm familiar with cubes of that speed, and I can take that speed down a couple of notches and value a different kind of spell for that reason. I do agree with uh, with your point here that the density and presence of green ramp can really also establish a lot about the speed of an environment because in some ways, uh, you know, a turn two, three drop or a turn three, four or five drop is just as threatening as somebody that goes one drop into two one drops in an aggro deck. It's just threatening a little bit of a different way. Right. Basically, speed-wise, uh, I think this is probably a middle, medium speed. I'm, I'm not too afraid of the super fastest decks, I'm not going to be very highly prioritizing stuff like the disfigures of the world and stuff like that. I'm going to be pretty happy to uh, to just stick with powerful cards and two-for-ones and stuff. Then my third thing is density of removal and board wipes. How did you feel about the density of removal and board wipes in this cube? Did you take a look at that? So board wipes is definitely a little bit lower than some of the cubes we've played. Though um, it is peasant-ish, and the board wipes are one of the places where this cube is breaking its rarity restriction for cards like End Hostilities and Route. Right. So I, I think that it's also, uh, there's this whole other meta layer where we're saying, hey, there are two wraths, but it's not even enough to say there are two wraths because that's not the issue. The question is how often are they played? Uh, so right. Because you, you could these... put, you know... Plague wind in a cube, and there's a wrath. Yeah. But that <laughs> put ten plague winds in. <laughs> but that wrath might as well not be in the cube because uh, very few cubes are going to get to the ten mana or whatever it costs to cast a plague wind. So I think that at these two wraths, I, I feel like that's not going to be a defining feature of the format. You're going to come across it yeah. occasionally, um, but it's not really going to dictate my choices in terms of like both shying away from aggro and, and mid range, and also you know uh, like obviously playing around them. Yeah, and I will say that I, I think for a cube of this size, the Removal density is lower than I would expect. Again, not expressing any value judgments of like there being not enough or whatever. It's a just a, it's just a number. It's a fact of the environment. We're trying to, to to spike this environment. 
But we have, let's see, one, two, three, four, five removal spells at instant speed in black, and then like one more at sorcery speed. So really pretty limited removal. Some of the removal is stapled onto creatures in the form of stuff like Ravenous Chupacabra. But this is an environment where I'm not going to be afraid to play a high value three, four, five mana spell, even if it's not necessarily resilient to removal, because from looking at this list, I think there's going to be a lot of, a lot of the complexity is going to be on board and how we, how you trade with threats and attack and block and handle that complexity and a lot less just removing stuff from your opponent as a, as a matter of your strategy. Like you're going to have the occasional removal spell kind of like retail limited to deal with their big bomb. But your your strategy is not going to be remove everything and you know scorch the earth and then go from there. And and I think also like signifying cards like Imperian Eagle that you know it sort of says suggests that you'll have a lot of flyers on board and soul herder that you're going to have uh, creatures on board to blink and things like Rhythm of the Wild which are again just like adding to your board state. There's a lot of like plus one plus one counters and and things that you know just require being on the board to matter. It really suggests that that's going to be the case. Yeah. So putting this all together. I'm on Booster Tutor for the reasons mentioned. I think that card's kind of broken. Again, assuming that it pulls from the cube or, you know, cards that were not drafted from the cube. So I, I'm going to be on that. I think my next pick is probably Utopia Sprawl. I think Utopia Sprawl is extraordinarily strong. It's like a Land of War Elf. You can't bolt. The cheap ramp seems like it's a little bit of a premium here. And I do think that is perhaps one of the ways that you will get ahead in this environment. It's just getting ahead on board. Because I don't expect that removal is going to be so abundant that I'll be setting myself back heavily on cards to ramp out a big threat and just have it eat a Doomblade. Yeah, me tonight, I think I'm on Utopia Sprawl. I, I think that you might Instead be Instead of right. Booster Tutor. Uh, that Booster Tutor is possibly slightly more powerful or, you know, a good bit more powerful. But I think Utopia Sprawl is just like a really solid place to start. And, and this this cube really indicates that like you're you're not going to be immediately uh, like risking a lot and losing a lot of value from from mm-hmm. using that as a tempo play. Yeah, the next cards I would be looking at would maybe be one of the dual lands. I'm not for sure thrilled to start on committal dual lands like that. Uh, you know, something like a fetch land or a five color land is much more open, and I'm more happy to start there. But this is an environment that does have the fetch lands in it, right. and so there's entirely possible that by having a bayou or by having a badlands in my pool, I'll be able to turn on a fetch land that I'll get in the future, uh, even one if I'm only playing one of those two colors. So because there are fetch lands here, I kind of think of those cards as a little bit of hybrid cards. But the other reason I'm kind of high on those is because, as we established, I don't think this is the fastest environment, and I don't think this is the most removal-dense environment. And both those things are pushing me towards playing more colors, not less. So fixing I'm going to take. Take it pretty highly. So I was going to say also that, you know, there are some themes that are indicated by some of the, especially some of the gold cards, like we have this blink theme uh, and a birthing pod theme and token themes. I don't see a ton that's really represented in like signpost cards that are in this pack itself, except potentially for Wall of Omens and Charming Prince for a little bit of a blink theme. But I'm not sure those are like keystones where I'm like, yeah, I've, I've got this card. Now I'm really going into it. Can't lose. Got Wall of Omens. <laughs> I mean, sometimes that happens. That's true against aggro pretty much. <laughs> Unless they have a removal spell for it. Yeah, that's actually, that's another small good point. Like because of the density of removal here and the presence of stuff like Wall of Omens, like you can deal with a Wall of Omens in an environment with tons of removal. Here, you know, it's going to be hard to deal with that Wall of Omens. If, uh, you know, you have a Flame Slash in red, it's a pretty efficient way to eat a Wall of Omens. But it's going to be hard for, like, really dedicated, low-to-the-ground creature-based aggro decks to deal with a Wall of Omens, even. As I see there's also Wall of Roots in green, like, just big blockers that come down really low on the, on the mana curve. Yeah, the, like, complexity of the metagame is so complicated like we're talking about wraths well right. are they here but what matters is how good are they actually yeah and then similarly we also do have one other kind of like more key synergy piece which is weaver of lightning which is a, a spells matter payoff but again i'm not i'm not sure that's like the thing that's going to draw me into that even if it's a, a pretty powerful deck in this environment yeah so i'm a booster tutor you're on utopia sprawl utopia sprawl is my number two and then i'm on to the fixing because this is an environment where i think i'm going to get to play more colors and be a little greedier and have some success with that. Seems like a reasonable reasonable way to go about it. Thank you, Ryan, for sending in your cube to have a pack with pick one on the show. If you want to be just like Ryan, send a link to your cube to mail at luckypaper.co with your name and pronouns, and we will do it on the show. That's it for Lucky Paper Radio. I hope you enjoyed this episode all about how to approach drafting a new cube list. And like I said, I think all of those points are things that if you are a cube designer, you should be thinking about because even if you're not the spikiest cube designer, if you're not designing your cube 
because you want to make a spiky draftable environment, maybe you have different goals. You want to make sure that your environment captures flavor or highlights art you really like or just shows off your collection. Be aware that there are always going to be competitively minded players that are going to be thinking about these things. And so at least consider your cube through these lenses because I think it will tell you a lot about what your players see when they look at your list. All of our music is produced by DJ James Nasty. All of the magic cards are made by Wizards of the Coast. All the listening is done by you, and all the talking is done by me under this blanket in Anthony's basement and Anthony. Thanks for talking magic with me, Anthony. It's a weird blanket choice. I got to do it for the sound quality, man. Got to get some foam or something down here. We'll, we'll, we'll do it up. Have you considered like buying a couple punching bags or something just to get in shape? That would also help with the acoustics. How much is a bunch of dogs? Uh, how much is a bunch of dogs? I mean, depends the kind of dogs. I big, think big fluffy ones. You could go to Barks, the animal shelter, and probably pick up a few <laughs> dogs on the cheap. Well, I'd like to foster your fluffiest dogs for an hour and a half, please. Yeah. I would really like to foster your most uh, sound absorbent dogs, please. I mean, uh, fluffiest, cutest dogs. <laughs> <laughs>